If you look around today, many people are struggling. Someone somewhere is worried and anxious about a prodigal child, a child who has lost their way. Someone else in this world has just received terrible news. Now life will never be the same again for them. So let me ask you, who do you depend on when life gets tough? Who do you depend on when you see nothing but trouble and chaos around you? Who do you depend on when you have no strength? Who is it that you depend on when you are faced with circumstances that you can do nothing about? Well, today, people of God, I want to encourage you to depend on God. Depend on a God who has given us wonderful promises in the Bible. Promises that should lift us up when life tries to push us down. Promises that should bring peace to our hearts even if our external environment is tumultuous. God's promises are what you and I should depend on because God is a faithful God. He's a God who keeps His word because He is truth. Now, I pray that this message will serve as a reminder to each and every believer listening. I want you to know that when you begin to trust in God's promises, you'll realize that you are well taken care of. You will lack for nothing. And for those who may be wondering, what are these promises? Allow me to remind you what the Bible says. In Isaiah 41, verse 13, the Bible says, For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, Fear not, I am the one who helps you. This is a promise. A promise for those seasons in life when you feel as though you can't get a break. It's a promise that God Almighty will help you. The Lord will come to your aid. He will be your support. He will be your pillar of strength. When the Bible says, be still and know that I am God, it's really telling you to stop everything you're doing. Stop worrying. Stop fighting. Stop resisting and start yielding to God. Start listening to God. There is something about stillness. And I believe that this verse is calling us to be still before the Lord because we need to direct all of our attention, all of our focus on the Lord. You see, when you spend time getting to know the Lord, when you spend time in the presence of Jesus Christ, you will truly be transformed. And I encourage you to desire and hunger for these types of rich encounters in the presence of God. Because it's only in those one-to-one -one intimate encounters that each of us can get a personal revelation of who God truly is. It's only in those one-to-one -one intimate encounters that each of us can be empowered and filled with courage. The courage to face the world and stand up for Christ. The courage to stand up to the devil and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Isaiah 40 verse 29 says, He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might he increases strength. This is a promise. A promise for us to hold on to in times of weakness. God will give strength to the weary. He will help you to stand when times get tough. He will help you to move forward when it looks like you are about to be overwhelmed. In Exodus 14, verse 14, the Bible says, The Lord will fight for you. You shall hold your peace. This is a promise for us. A promise of safety. God will fight your battles. He will fight our battles, and we need only to hold our peace. And so there is no need to go back and forth trying to fight here, there, and everywhere. Instead, let God work on your behalf because we have a promise that the battle you face belongs to the Lord. The Bible in Philippians 4 verse 19 says, and my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. This is a promise for provision. If you have a need, God can meet that need. This doesn't mean you will have everything you want, but in Jesus Christ, you will have everything that you can ever need. 
So I encourage you to get to know God's promises. Get to know them and hold on to His promises. The prophet Isaiah received a revelation that should inspire all of us to recognize God for who He truly is. Listen carefully to what Isaiah 45 verse 2 to 7 says. I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places, that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake and Israel my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. This is a wonderful revelation of just who God is. God is firmly in control. God is all-knowing. God is almighty. Isaiah 45, 22 to 23 says, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That to me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall take an oath. In those moments where we are still before God, we need to realize just how mighty God is, just how powerful God is. The Bible tells us there is no one and nothing that can be compared to God. We need to remember this. Nothing and no one is worthy to be competing for the number one spot of your heart. God should be first. What does the Christian of today look like? And what should the Christian of today look like? These are two very different questions which can have two very different answers depending on who you ask. Now, the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, verse 21, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Listen to this closely. Because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. I believe that this is true Christianity, following the example of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ left heaven for earth to die for our sins. He put the church before himself. He obeyed God's will. He lived a life of purpose, a purpose that can be summed up with his words in Luke 22, verse 42, which says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. When we get to such a place, this is what I believe to be true Christianity. Now, I would like to encourage you to take the following steps so that you can make sure you are marching forward and living a life that pleases the Lord. To begin with, we all need to live lives where God is first. You and I need to live a life that places God above everything. Place God before everything. The Amplified Translation for Luke 9, verse 23 says, And he was saying to them all, If anyone wishes to follow me as my disciple, he must deny himself, set aside selfish interests, and take up his cross daily, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come, and follow me, believing in me, conforming to my example in living and, if need be, suffering or perhaps dying because of faith in me. 
This reminds me of the song that says, Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noontime, Jesus when the sun goes down. And to me, this means living a life where you are completely consumed by the Lord's presence, by His Word, by the Holy Spirit. And no, it doesn't mean you neglect your day-to-day responsibilities because you're praying 24-7. No, it simply means that your mind is constantly fixed on Jesus Christ. You're either quietly meditating on a verse as you are making breakfast or you're worshiping and praising as you are driving. Whatever it is, have the presence of mind to ask yourself, am I connected to the Lord? Am I glorifying the Lord? Now, the phrase, put God first, has become very popular in this day and age, but in practical terms, what does it mean? Well, when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, he answered in Matthew 22, verse 37. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. This says to me that your love for Jesus Christ supersedes everything. It's a love that prioritizes the Lord. God first really means God first. Now, another point that I'd like to highlight about a real follower of Jesus Christ is that they fear the Lord. And to fear God isn't to say that you're terrified of Him. No. To fear God is to realize who He is, how big He is, how mighty and all-powerful He is, and this leads you to have a deep respect, reverence, and awe for God's power and authority. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of God is what motivates godly behavior. The fear of God leads one to repent and pursue a holy life. The fear of God keeps you on the straight and narrow. When you fear God, You do not take sin lightly because you know that God is holy and pure and he does not tolerate unrighteousness and impurity. Further traits of a real follower of Jesus Christ are that they serve wholeheartedly. All they do is to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31 says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. I encourage you to do all that you can in God's kingdom, but do it to bring glory to Him and not for yourself. Serve for the glory of Jesus Christ. Serve so that unbelievers and those who are lost may see the goodness of God through you. Serve with pure intentions. Serve with godly intentions. A lot of us need to be obedient to Galatians 5 verse 13, which says, For you were called to freedom, brothers, Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. When you serve for the glory of God, this, I believe, is when you are truly imitating Christ. Now, my final point is closely linked to this matter of serving. A true follower of Jesus Christ is humble. And humility doesn't mean you allow yourself to be used and abused. It simply means you don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. And you don't think any less of others than you ought to. And to be honest, this is a matter that's all to do with pride. Pride says, I can do this on my own. Pride says, I'm self-made. I am successful and I did it because I worked hard. Pride says, look at me. Look what I have done. However, humility says, in my weakness, God's strength is made perfect. Humility says, God will give me strength. God will renew my strength. I believe I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do you see the difference? Pride says, look at me. But humility says, look at Christ. Pride says, look at what I have done, but humility says, look at what the Lord has done. James 4, 6, but he gives more grace. 
Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You find favor in being humble. You find blessings in being humble. So I encourage you to be someone who puts God first. Whether it's day or night, come rain or sunshine, put God first. Be someone who lives with the fear of the Lord in their life. Revere and honor our Lord Jesus Christ always. And finally, be humble. Always be humble in everything you do. Seek to serve others all for the glory of God. People of God, I want to ask you something. When was the last time you publicly acknowledged Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Now, it may have been to a co-worker that you see every day, or to someone you just met and struck up a conversation with. But overall, I believe that every single one of us during the course of our lives, we will have at least one opportunity to publicly declare what we believe and who we believe in. The Bible says in Matthew 10, verse 32, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. Now, I don't know about you, saints, but here's my confession. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can get to the Father except through Jesus. I believe he is the bread of life. He is the one who can sustain us. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. And in him, you will find peace beyond all human understanding. I believe Jesus Christ is the light of the world and the good shepherd. I believe he was a healer and a miracle worker when he walked here on this earth. And I also believe that he is still able to do the impossible even today. I believe he died on a cross for our sins, for my sins. And I believe that he rose back to life after three days and ascended on high and right now he is seated on the right side of the father listen to me in the name of jesus there is power jesus christ is the name above every other name he is the author and the finisher of our faith he is the risen one the almighty one when we speak that name the mighty name of Jesus Christ, every sickness has to bow. Every disease has to leave. Every chain has to loose. And so here is my word to you as believers. We should not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should never compromise the word of God so that we can fit into this world. We should not be ashamed of the gospel because the devil in the world Oh, they are aggressively spreading a message of deception. The devil in this world is aggressively trying to lead people away from the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. And so it's time that we as believers of Jesus Christ, it's time for us to stand up and to declare to the world that there is a savior. There is someone who can set you free if you're bound. There is a redeemer and his name is Jesus Christ. Saints, we should not be ashamed of the gospel, but as Christians, we must stand up and fight for the gospel. We must rise up as sons and daughters of the Most High and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord.